Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live, interactive learning at your desktop. My name is Carolyn Moore, and I will be moderating today's program. Today's web seminar is titled, The Science of Modern Agriculture, Engineering Machines, Sensors, and Drones. Our presenters this evening are Valerie Bays, Jarrett Seglinski, and Jennifer Becker. And now I'd like to introduce again uh, Valerie. Valerie? Great, thank you. So welcome, thank you for joining us this Thursday evening. Um, Monsanto is an agriculture company. We sell and um, create innovations for farmers. Um, we're also a publicly traded company, so we speak with our shareholders. And for a long time, those are really the two audiences that we spoke to the most. Farmers, people we sell things to, and shareholders. We really did not do a good job of talking to consumers, people who are curious about where their food comes from, how it's grown, you know, what are these things that, um, you know, that are called GMOs, what are those? And we didn't do a good job of telling our story. And when you don't tell your story, um, sometimes others will tell it for you and it's not always correct. So we really wanted to create um, a learning opportunity to not only kind of share our um, stories of the science of modern agriculture, but also answer questions that you have. So we've decided to partner with NSTA to host this webinar series. This is part four of a five-part series. The, fir and, um, the, the first three, those are all archived if you wanted to go back and look at those. The first one was about GMOs and breeding. The second one was about insects and, you know, what does an entomologist do? The third was about crop protection and chemistries used in agriculture. And then here we have, um, this one's going to be focused all on engineering and the engineering design process. And the next one, the last one rather, uh, February 21st will be on microbials and ag biologicals, um, which will lead us to the national conference um, in Atlanta, Georgia. So how many of you will be at the national conference? Carolyn, you want to do the poll? You bet. So uh, up there by your name is a little green check mark if you will uh, determine whether or not you're going to be coming to the national conference by choosing the green check for yes or the red X for no. Uh, i give you a few seconds to put down uh, your response and then I'll lock in the poll so Valerie can see how many of us are going to be able to make it to the national conference. There's about 30 of us here, so we're going to wait uh, just a few more seconds and make sure everybody can find that green check mark up there by their name. Okay, so Valerie, if you just give me a second, I'm going to lock in the responses and make that chart available for you to see more clearly. All right, so seven, great. And maybe some of the folks who, who didn't have the, the chance to vote. So the seven of you who will be at the national conference, um, we will be there too. We're going to have a booth, and we'll also have three kind of interactive, hands-on um, breakout sessions. So if we don't answer your questions here, you can always email us. Or uh, if you have the opportunity to go to the conference, you can visit us in person. Okay, so when I think of the sophistication of modern agriculture, I can very clearly see the opportunities where the next generation science standards in agriculture uh, intersect. But I'm curious to know where you all see some of these opportunities. And even though it says high school there at the top, even if you're not a high school teacher, um, where do you see some of the next gen um, science standards aligning with the sophistication of agriculture? And Carolyn, you want to explain how to use the icon? 
Sure. I've made the toolbox visible to everybody. It's that long, skinny, rectangular box, and you're going to go way down to the bottom and click on that bottom icon and find common symbols, and then choose the symbol you'd like to use to record where you are on the chart. Great. So this is exactly um, what we want to see. I think that Jarrett and Jennifer would agree that all of the places that these icons are going, we can think of very tangible examples of how agriculture fits into um, some of those standards. So thank you for participating in this. Um, and we'd love to know how to get more ag-related concepts into science curriculum. All right, so for this evening, um, we're going to go through intros, uh, go through some helpful resources, the meat of the presentation, and then open it up for kind of a ask us anything Q&A. There will be um, question staffs after each of the presenters' sections, um, so don't feel like you have to wait till the very end to ask your questions. Um, as far as introductions, my name is Valerie Bays. My background is in biological science. I went to the University of Missouri Columbia, go Tigers. Um, I majored in biology because I thought that I wanted to go to dental school, and I realized about my last semester of undergrad that I was not as passionate about oral health as I once thought. So I would no longer be going to dental school. Around that time, I then applied for a position um, at a data science company where I basically um, conducted, I was the, the middle conduit between the pharmaceutical companies trying um, new therapies and the, um, the company to actually run the trials and then interpreting that data. Um, I really didn't find that work to be um, very satisfying, so I, I moved on and I started substitute teaching at a local school district and I loved it. Uh, Julie, we lost you. All right, Jennifer, we'll just have you step in here until uh, uh, Valerie is able to call back in. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. So I'm Jennifer Becker. I graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in chemical engineering and a minor in chemistry. And I have a position where I'm an optimization lead for innovation group. And if you think about that, what that really equates to is I have responsibility for connecting um, all of the inventions. So we kind of work, Jarrett and I actually work in what I would consider to be a think tank, um, where we're inventing things. Um, and as a result of that, whatever those items are, we, we work to get patents on them. And then we work to deploy them. Often that's in our manufacturing facilities or in our fields. And, and my role is actually the testing and deployment of those different inventions. So I have had responsibilities for implementing strategies that really increase profitability or reduce risk. Um, typically within a highly matrix team structure. And what that means is a lot of the problems that we have to solve, you can't solve by yourself. And it takes a number of disciplines coming together for one common cause. Um, to, to work through the problems and, and eventually come to a solution. I actually have been in the industry for over 20 years, and I've also been with Monsanto for over 20 years. 
in a, a number of diverse roles, including process engineering, maintenance engineering, product development, uh, and also risk management. In addition to that, I've held leadership roles and have had an operating budget of over $40 million. And often, the projects that I am lucky enough to get to work on, if you want to call that luck, is I am often working with teams where we have a burning platform and the team may be in crisis. So I, I have a very short attention span. I like to work on lots of things all the time. And I, I actually enjoy a little bit of chaos. Uh, so the, the job for me is perfect. And I also get to work with lots of people all over the country and all over the world trying to solve a multitude of different problems. So, you know, you know, as we walk through this um, program this evening, um, please feel free to ask any questions you might like. I'm a certified Six Sigma Black Belt, a lean practitioner, and I've also taught in North America and in Europe. So background in statistics in addition to engineering. So welcome. Great, thanks, Jen. Sorry, everybody, my um, call dropped. <laughs> um, to make it a, a quick wrap up of, of my background, so I started working at a school, loved it, went back, got my master's in education and certification in secondary biology. Around that time, Monsanto was looking to ramp up their um, education outreach efforts. So here I am. Uh, Jarrett, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Val. Um, my name is Jarrett Siglinski. I've been with Monsanto uh, not quite 10 years now as a various roles in engineering. I started in project management um, in 2009, um, worked in a, our manufacturing facilities all over North America, doing anything from remodels of existing production facilities and production lines and conveyors and packaging equipment to uh, putting on new roofs to uh, I was in charge of building a and complete um, manufacturing facility from the ground up in Arizona in 2013 and then uh, in late 2013 I transferred to um, innovation engineering where I work with Jennifer um, as an automation engineer I have probably the coolest job in the world for an engineer I get to be like Mythbusters and come to work every day and invent there are a multitude of problems that need to be solved in the world of agriculture today, and uh, my team gets to go out and uh, and solve those and get to use technology. I have a, of all facets. Uh, I have a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Illinois, um, but just because I'm a mechanical degreed engineer doesn't mean I don't do electrical work. I do um, computer programming. I get involved in biology and zoology and pretty much anything and everything. Engineering is science and action. So it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'm never sure exactly what uh, the scientists are going to want when they come to my door uh, asking me for to build new equipment for the lab or, you know, uh, new equipment for the field or coming up with some new uh, way to do things. So it's, it's really great to uh, just try something different every day. I also have a very short attention span like, uh, Jen and uh, constantly wanting to see what's new out there. So um, that's my short 30 second intro. Um, I hope everybody gets a lot out of today's uh, webinar and uh, looking forward to all the questions uh, that people might have about what, uh, what we get to do and the problems we're trying to solve. Thanks. Great, thank you. And Jarrett will be accompanying me at the um, National Science Teachers Convention in March. So if you hear something interesting during the program and you're going to be at the, um, the conference, you know, feel free to stop by the booth and, and meet him in person. So um, a quick highlight on a fairly new documentary called Food Evolution. Food Evolution was funded by the Institute of Food Technologists. It's narrated by um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I think it gives a really um, balanced and uh, pragmatic view of um, kind of controversial topics like GMOs, um, both from a, a domestic lens and an international or global lens. Um, it, uh, they have a partnership with uh, United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, USFRA, 
And from my understanding, USFRA is a building um, educator tool so that this film can be used to, uh, in the classroom during, you know, a 50-minute period of time. So it's available um, to watch on Hulu and YouTube currently, um, and I think Amazon, um, if you wanted to check that out. Another quick highlight, um, just some, on some teacher resources. Uh, I won't go through every single one of these, but if you have a chance to go back and screenshot this or um, uh, see the archive, I encourage you to look at each and every one of these. So for podcasts, if you're not aware of Science Versus, I think it's a really great podcast, you know, while you're driving into work or you're waiting on your lunch break for your next class to come in, um, to really spend that time learning something interesting and new. And they cover all sorts of kind of controversial topics, everything from sugar and high fructose corn syrup to, uh, you know, cleansing and detox remedies um, and, and everything in between. Um, for teacher professional development, I think it would be uh, really awesome if you guys, especially since you self-selected to come to this webinar, um, checked out some of the precision agriculture lesson plans on the Grow Next Gen website. Um, BioBuilder is also a really cool teacher PD program that helps teachers better understand synthetic biology. And they cover everything from, um, you know, bioremediation to uh, uh, synth uh, synthetic, synthetic fibers and, and things like that. Um, a couple of the other ones I would highlight are uh, the Ag Education Discussion Lab. It's a private group on Facebook, but um, the person who started it, you know, obviously just really wants to share best practices with other teachers. So if you have a chance and you have a Facebook account, I highly recommend checking out that Ag Discussion Lab where they're sharing, um, you know, lesson plans on uh, how to take a field trip to, to your local grocery store and have your students have a clipboard and go through X, Y, and Z uh, lesson. Um, to, you know, how do you handle this situation when a parent calls and does X. So it's really a great tool for teachers, and I love just reading the threads on there. Um, another uh, lesson plan that I'd like to highlight is, um, so Montana was re receiving a fair number of requests from students as young as, you know, seventh grade asking for genetically engineered seeds and conventional seeds to do science fair projects or just to grow in their classroom and phenotypically you know, look at them. Um, and we didn't really have a very great process for that. So through some trial and error, we finally found a great partner in agriculture in the classroom. So if you're interested in doing these hands-on activities that are accompanied with lesson plans um, and kit materials, uh, please check out those links there. Okay, and throughout throughout the webinar, if you have any questions um, that we, you know, don't get to, you can always email us at this uh, general inbox here, stemeducation.outreach.monsino.com. Okay, so when we, can you guys all hear me still? Don? Yes, you're fine. Okay, so when we um, look at, you know, what is the shape of the problem in agriculture, when it comes to growing food, fuel, and fiber, farmers face, um, you know, they face a couple challenges. They face challenges like drought and soil compaction and hungry insects that want to devour their crops and plant pathogens or diseases and fungal pressure that can impede the plant's ability to photosynthesize properly and those pesky weeds that are stealing resources from the desired crop. So they have a couple of challenges that they're facing when trying to grow food for a growing population. Um, and we're, we're going to need to grow as much food in the next 50 years as in the past 10,000 years combined. Currently, we have over um, 7 billion people on the planet, and by 2050, we'll have over 9 billion. And in some reports, I've seen close to 10 billion. So that's a lot of people. Um, 
we also have a, a changing climate. So, you know, potentially areas that didn't have a whole lot of pest pressure because they had harsh winters to kind of kill off those insects, um, maybe those areas are getting warmer now. And so when the farmers, um, you know, go to grow their crop, they now have this pest pressure that they otherwise, you know, didn't have to manage. Um, the decline in arable land and changing economies in diet. So as people gain access to more income, they uh, have an increased demand in, in meat. And obviously those animals need to be fed something like grain. But all is not lost. Um, with the adoption of, of different forms of technology, different tools in the toolbox. So whether it's biological tools, chemical tools, or mechanical you know, solutions and tools for farmers, we can use all of these different technologies um, to be more efficient and sustainable and productive. So I have a couple of examples here. That's a transgenic um, soybean plant there. You can see that it's doing really well, and the, the weeds that were competing for resources have perished along the side of the tray. Um, using data science platforms, which we'll talk about today. Drone technology, which we'll talk about today. And just adopting good agronomic practices, um, like cover crops or no-till. So like I said, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox. Um, there's no one solution. Um, there's no one silver bullet. Um, agriculture is a system, so we need lots of different tools to um, be more sustainable and to help farmers be productive. So in this webinar, we're really going to be focusing more on data science and mechanics. Um, but like I said, in those other um, archived presentations, we cover some of the other uh, uh, challenges and solutions that farmers face. So um, we can take two questions here, or we can keep moving um, into Jen's portion. Do you have a preference? I'm not seeing any questions yet, Valerie, so we'll go ahead and continue on, and I'll keep monitoring the chat window. OK, great. So Jen is um, going to take us through more about what engineers do. and. Um, how to use the engineering design process. Go ahead, Jen. Thanks, Valerie. So good, e good evening, everyone. So as when Valerie asked me to talk a little bit about what engineers do and give a couple of examples of what we might do in, in the day-to-day -day world, you know, I thought to myself a little bit about how was I able to get to where I am today? And I felt like the best way to do that was to tell you a little bit more about myself. And, I, you know, I really would like to give a shout out to everybody on the room. Um, both my parents are educators. And I've had three or four really influential teachers that shaped my life. And um, so a little bit about my background is I was one of those kids in middle school that really liked math and science. However, the high school that I was going to go to was really strong in liberal arts. And as and my parents were both educators, but they were very, very creative, and they really didn't know anything about math and science. But what they did know is as a parent and as an educator, they were trying to foster you know, my desires and really my interests. So as a result of that, I actually was able to go to a neighboring high school uh, that, that was really renowned for math and science. And at that high school, so that was really kind of my first foray where, you know, I had parents that were educators. They were phenomenal. They, they allowed me to go to a school that really was going to foster that growth. And at that high school, I had a biology teacher who was a former pharmacist, and he just had this love and curiosity for science. And at the time, and, and, and again, I was one of those kids that, you know, a, a lot of people had their idols, and, you know, they would have had rock stars on their walls. And, and my, my idol was James Watson, the the founder of the DNA, the founder of DNA, 
And so this this teacher that I had that was a biologist and also a pharmacist helped me and allowed me to do an independent study for four years in genetic engineering. And as a result of that, and, and, and throughout that time, I was able to compete at the state level um, for the work I had done in genetics. So you got to think, this is the early, late 80s, early 90s, where I was able to do this work. And it was because of a teacher, and it was because it was something they did not need to do. And as a result of that, I actually won at the state level and was introduced to another professor, which is how I ended up at the University of Iowa, and was allowed to do research in the College of Engineering. And I also was able to do pharmaceutical research. And the for people that don't know anything about the University of Iowa, it has a hospital. It actually has three hospitals right on campus, a VA hospital, a, a local hospital, and then a large university hospital. And the chemical engineering department had really good linkages with the, the university hospital. So I was able to do graduate research as an undergrad um, with, in conjunction with this professor in genetics. It just so happened that I was presenting my work in Oklahoma, and the president of the American Institute of Chemical Engineering worked for Monsanto and came up to me after the presentation. And at the time, Monsanto was the number three chemical company in the world, but came up to me and said, you know, if you really want to stay in this place, you want to be with a cutting edge company, a company that's on the cusp of changing direction and where things are going to be really exciting, check them out. And the rest is history. And so had it not been for those linkages and those connections with those just a handful of educators, I wouldn't be where I am today. So again, shout out to all you guys. So, you know, when I stand back and I think about what is it that engineers do? You know, like Jared said, they can do a lot of things, but you can really boil it down in, into three areas. It's really creating, exploring, and innovating. And the, the, there is a fundamental difference. So one thing that I knew, or that I didn't know, I guess, when I was in high school, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, I definitely knew it would be in math and science. I was trying to figure out if I was going to go into chemistry, biology, or engineering, this thing called engineering. And the, the thing that I didn't know about engineering at the time, fundamentally, the difference between science, so kind of the theoretical sciences, and engineering is the sciences are very much about theory and trying to take that theory and, and making, putting applications to that on a pretty small scale. Engineering gets the handoff of that. And for me, that's super exciting because that's where the action's at. Just like Jarrett said, you know, it, it, it's putting science into action. And as th just the fundamental understanding of that, I think, really can help shape students and guide them really based on their skills their strengths and also can help them understand, you know, based on, on their abilities where if, if they know they're interested in math and science, may help guide them into to different arenas because we really going forward in this next generation, in order to solve the problems we need to solve, we need to have really strong math and science um, in, in the future generation, and we also need to have folks that can collaborate and talk to people in the think tanks that can connect all these things together so we can actually deploy them, um, you know, out into the world from an application standpoint. Because as Valerie talked specifically in the, in the ag space, our focus is all on how do you do that and how are you going to feed the, the world you know, a generation from now, knowing that you've got to make more food in that generation than you've made in tens of thousands of years, you know, many, many years prior. And 
For Monsanto, we recognize that we're a small piece of that agronomic solution, but the things that we target is improvements on food, fuel, and fiber. And along that, pretty much anything within engineering falls into one of four categories um, that, that we tend to work on in this space. And it doesn't matter if you're a chemical engineer, a mechanical engineer, or an electrical engineer. It falls into one of these four categories. The first one is in, is in yield. And that is really, you know, we produce seed. We produce um, chemicals that, that help. We, we have a full agronomic solution. So we, we have seed. We have data science that can help the grower grow their, you know, figure out when to plant, when they need to apply chemicals. We actually produce those chemicals. And, and we have a full agronomic uh, package. So the first one is around yield. How can you improve the farmer, the farmer experience? How can they get more um, output with less input? The next area is really in that sustainability area. There's only a certain amount of land. And with that amount of land, that's finite. And so how can we improve things like cultural inputs? Maybe that's nitrogen. Um, for sure, that's water. And be able to produce the same or more outputs with, with the fixed amount of inputs that we're going to have. The third area is in service. So from an engineering standpoint, how do you deliver data in, as quickly and as efficiently, uh, whether that's a farmer sitting in a field and he wants to have his data right on the spot because he's trying to make decisions on the fly um, and, and trying to be transparent with that data as well. And in the last area is, is quality. How do you improve the purity of your products, um, whether that's in, in the manufacturing um, arena, whether that's in our fields or in our facilities? So what we're going to do for the next, between Jarrett and I, we're going to cover three different applications of engineering. And I'm going to talk about um, water utilization and how we use technology to study drought, as an example. And then Jared's going to co cover an invention that we have um, called the seed chipper. And it's a device that allows us to quickly determine genetic properties of an individual seed without destroying it. And we're able to do seeds at, a, at an extraordinary rate. And I won't take Jared's thunder because this, this invention is incredible. And it was, it was really disruptive to how we ran our business and transformational. And then the last application is, as everybody knows, it's a hot topic in the media around drones and the applications in agriculture. And we'll talk to you about that. So moving forward, in the, the first piece that I'm going to talk to you about is water utilization. And a project that our group had around uh, something called a rainout shelter. So if we go back and we think about those key areas where scientists and engineers within Monsanto and within the ag space really drive value, two of those key areas are in yield and sustainability. So how can you improve um, both internal and farmer yield while reducing seed loss is the first one. And from a sustainability, how can you, part, part of what scientists in our organization and engineers look at are how can you improve water efficiency and agri agricultural inputs while still getting the same output on the back end? And this project actually really touches on that and helped us get to a place where we could actually do a number of experiments um, that were in a somewhat controlled environment. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So one of our challenges, um, so a team of scientists were working together on these, uh, have been working together in drought, drought tolerant genes and improvements. And there's a breeding group. And what that breeding group does is, is they're looking at a number of different genetics and different combinations of genetics that may help with drought tolerance. And it just so happens that one of those groups happens to be in, in the middle of the Corn Belt, in the middle of Nebraska. And so because they're housed there, 
that's where all these experiments are run. So, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times I think when people, when we talk about creating inventions and what do we do, for Monsanto, a lot of stuff is where the action's at. So a lot of our work might be developed in a lab, but all of the deployment ends up anywhere in the world. You could be in India, you could be in Malaysia, you could be in Brazil, you could be in the middle of Nebraska. And so this project actually is in this random place in Nebraska, just like I live in a random place in Iowa. And um, prior to this project, what happened was we had scientists that were running many, many experiments, but the trouble was it was all being run at a bench top or in a greenhouse. And either there weren't enough plants and you didn't have enough data to make good scientific conclusions, and the other trouble was in a greenhouse, it doesn't emulate what happens in, in the real world, and it was actually too controlled. So what we needed to do is we needed to run an experiment on a larger scale and mimic real life. And so what you can see is in this photo, and this is in the middle of the cornfield in Nebraska, we actually have a field that's about a third of an acre long, uh, a third of an acre in footprint. And, and that field is planted just like any other field would be planted. The only exception to that is the fact that there's a number of moisture sensors throughout that field. And those moisture sensors are looking to detect water. And so remember these breeders are looking for drought tolerance and, and how can we, you know, possibly grow, grow food in arid climates where there isn't very much water. And so what they're now able to do is they're able to, to take the, the different um, genetics, they're able to run different tests just like they would in a field, and then when it rains, what happens is actually the roof um, closes just very, very similar to what you would see in a football stadium. The football stadiums that have uh, the overhead roofs, roofs, and you can see there's a sliding rail here, and what will happen is a moisture sensor will go off, it'll trigger a sensor, and within two minutes, that entire plot of land is actually covered. And you'll see here that this picture was taken, moments, this was taken after a torrential rainstorm in that plot. So so while they're getting exposure to, these, these plants are getting the sun exposure, they're getting the wind exposure, they're getting the light exposure that a normal crop would get, they, they have very controlled conditions from a water standpoint. So you can imagine now suddenly you're controlling, you know, all your, Everything else is in a controlled environment, and, you, and it, in the same token, it's also mimicking uh, real life. So that's, that's really the first example. Does anybody have any questions before I hand this over to Garrett? I have been uh, checking with the chat for questions, Jennifer, and none have shown up yet. So as they do, I'll make a list of them and uh, let you know for the next question and answer period. Perfect. Thank you. Jared? Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to move forward here into the seed chipper. I want to take you back in time just a little bit um, to 2008. Uh, we were doing uh, plant breeding and trying to bring uh, Roundup Ready 2 soybean varieties out into the market. and. Uh, we were trying to figure a way how to speed the process of bringing uh, new genetics and new varieties of soybeans to the market uh, faster. Um, traditionally, um, plants have been breeded or bred um, for new genetics, and that process is done through a culling process. So you grow a bunch of plants to full maturity. You take a bunch of the breeders walk through the field, take a bunch of notes, and then they would go back through the field and either remove or not harvest uh, the plants that didn't have the traits they desired. Maybe the plants were too short, or they weren't uh, insect tolerant, or they weren't uh, fungi uh, fungus or tolerant, or just different traits they were looking for. 
And that process could take anywhere from three to five years to bring a new uh, variety into uh, the marketplace and be useful for farmers to use. So we were looking for a better way to do it. Um, and so I'm going to go through a corn example just because I've got a, a little better pictures to show um, versus the soybean example that I first laid out. Um, so the way we would originally go through and do the process of determining which plants were good and which ones were the ones that we wanted to get rid of, you would not only take notes and do a visual inspection, but we would also do a genetics um, test. And to get a sample without destroying the plant, we would send uh, just large teams of workers out in the field with hole punches, just standard off-the-shelf office hole punches. And they would go out and punch a small tissue sample out of a leaf, put it in a test tube, and then take that back to a lab and do the analysis on it. And then they would find out, well, that plant really didn't have the, the Roundup Ready gene we were looking for or wasn't uh, drought tolerant or wasn't, um, you know, a good yielding plant. And it would take a lot of time and a lot of labor. And there was a lot of places where you could make a human error and get samples mixed up or, you know, pick, find the wrong place in the wrong field or just sample the wrong plant. And it just took a lot of time and it was very labor intensive, it took a lot of land. Um, you know, you had to grow hundreds of thousands of plants and then sample them when you only really maybe needed, you know, a thousand plants out of all those plants that were, were originally put into the, into the field. So our scientists and our researchers and our engineers got together and said, you know, what if we could make our breeding selections before the, the seed was ever put in the ground? What if we could make that decision before we, we used all the land and we used the water to grow the seed? What if we could make that decision way earlier and uh, save some resources and, and save some time? So a, a bunch of engineers got together with scientists. We had a, a multiple discipline team of mechanical engineers, software engineers, electrical engineers, imaging scientists who, you know, are experts at how to inspect things using cameras and, and light waves um, to do analysis. And we got together with our geneticists to make sure that we weren't getting contamination between, uh, you know, the samples to make sure that we weren't getting seed one and seed two mixed together so that you could get false positives or false readings to make sure that we were on the genetic side of things staying very scientifically sound. So we would develop a machine called the seed chipper that uh, Jen alluded to earlier. I've got my pointer here on the screen, this picture here. That machine was developed over about an 18 month uh, to 24 month period with a team of about 15 engineers of various disciplines. Um, and they built uh, machines to do uh, thousands of seeds a, a day. So the, the machine picks up a seed, it takes an image of it. Um, the image is then processed and the seed is rotated um, so that the cap or the top of the seed is faced against the saw blade. The saw blade rotates and then uh, the dust that is collected, the sawdust basically, is collected and transported over to a little well plate and that's where the DNA test is done. And then your soybeans are left with what uh, Val and I like to recall or refer to as a ver reverse mohawk. That little chip in that seed or the little cut in the seed doesn't harm the seed at all. We can take that seed and still plant it. So after the seed is chipped, the dust is collected and put into one uh, tray and the seeds are put into another tray. The tray that has the seeds in it is then indexed and stored in a warehouse. Then all the DNA uh, analysis is done uh, by another process, and all that data is then paired with the seeds that have been saved in a warehouse. So our breeders can then go into a computer database and say, I'm looking for uh, a parent seed that has really good stock quality and has really good drought tolerance, and I'm also looking for another plant to breed with it that has um, good nitrogen utilization. So they can say, I want seed 1,582, and I want seed 10,674. And then the computer sends a signal back to a robot. The robot goes into the warehouse, finds those two seeds, automatically puts them in an envelope, and mails it to that breeder. And the breeder can plant those seeds in the field. And the powerful thing about that is the breeder knows before that seed ever goes in the ground that if that corn plant or that soybean plant reaches full maturity, it'll have the exact traits that they wanted before it 
with no questions. So it saves a ton of resources and not only time, uh, because it cuts our breeding cycle from about five years, three to five years, down to between 18 and 24 months, maybe even two, 30 months, depending on if you run into a few roadblocks. It also saves us a huge amount of land. The picture down here in the corner shows the normal area we would have used to get 250 uh, usable leaf tissue samples. And then using chipping, we're able to use about a fifth less of the normal area we would in the field. Um, so that's that's how we used uh, technologies, various technologies from imaging uh, to DNA to uh, electronics and motor controls to mechanisms for doing a very simple saw blade um, and air conveyance to move the dust and the seeds around um, to data science and data analytics, as well as database entry and software programming to do all of our data handling and decision making and to build all those algorithms. So it was a, a pretty neat project um, that has just been uh, a real game changer in plant breeding uh, for Monsanto and uh, really gave us uh, an advantage to bring new uh, technologies and new genetics to the market uh, years ahead of uh, traditional methods. Uh, with that, uh, we'll pause for a couple of questions if anyone has any. and. Uh, Go from there. Thank you, Jared. We do have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, do you only chip corn or do you chip other seeds? So we actually chipped, uh, I don't remember the exact number of uh, different uh, crops we're currently doing, but I can give you some examples. We're currently doing corn, soy, uh, cotton, uh, cucumber, watermelon, sweet corn, wheat. Um, those are the the ones I can recall off the top of my head. So we've built custom chipping machines uh, for all those various um, types of crops uh, to date. Wow. <laughs> Another question that uh, several people had was, are all the seeds GMO that are chipped, or is this more of a breeding effort? It's more of a breeding effort. Well, you can do both. You can do both types of seeds. You can do conventional seeds as well as GMOs. Um, might turn some of that over to Val. Uh, she, she's a little bit more up on the biology side of things than I am. But uh, we use them for both types of seeds. But this definitely is a huge breeding tool so that the uh, researchers and the breeders can cross the, the plants um, more effectively um, without uh, a lot of guesswork, right? So you would you could pretty much make your predetermined breeding uh, crosses before they're ever planted in the field. So I hope that helps answer it a little bit. Uh, it looks like Val's replied a little bit more um, to the room as well. So, yes, uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, Tracy asks. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to clarify that. Um, you know, there are only ten commercially available genetically engineered crops. So things like melons and cucumbers um, are not genetically engineered. Um, so those, you know, those are just conventional seeds that we're chipping for our vegetable seed uh, uh, portfolio. Um, and then as far as seeds like soy, corn, and cotton, those can be either conventional or genetically engineered. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, one thing that I had not thought about, but maybe you guys could pose this question to your students, is, you know, why did Monsanto decide to choose those particular seeds over, you know, something like a tomato seed? Um, and I had that question, and it turns out that um, using all of that, you know, the vacuums and the imaging technology and the small blades that kind of take the reverse mohawk out of the seed, um, if you have a small seed like a tomato, it makes it really difficult, right, Jared? Yes, uh, tomato is extremely difficult um, just because of its size and the uh, the embryo uh, section of the seed on the tomato is extremely fragile um, and takes up a, a large portion of that seed. There isn't a lot of food store inside of a tomato seed like you would normally uh, see in corn or soy, uh, so the embryo is very close to the surface. Also, static. Electricity is really big in uh, those smaller seeds like broccoli, cauliflower, tomato, um, cucumber, or not cucumber, uh, peppers. 
those seeds are small. Static electricity makes them very hard to move, uh, surprisingly, uh, especially using air conveyance methods um, that we uh, typically use for these chipping applications. Thank you, Jared. And Tracy asks, what traits are most requested? I'm I'm not sure, Val. Do you do you know off the top of your head? Well, when it comes to something like corn, for example, you're looking for traits that are like um, disease resistance, or you're looking for traits that confer uh, uh, you know drought resistance, or do better uh, do better in drought conditions. Um, or hardier stock, uh, stocks for um, regions that maybe have a lot of hail or wind. Um, so it really just kind of depends on the crop and kind of what you're looking for, but you use techniques like uh, molecular markers to look for um, those uh, snippets of, of DNA. Thank you very much. We have one more question we'll take right now. It's from Mike. He asks, how can you quantify specific growth characteristics, qualitative data versus quantitative? Sure. And some of that's done through uh, breeding notes in the field and historical data. Some of that's done through uh, genomic mapping, uh, so we know where those specific genes lie in the, uh, in the spectrum. Um, add to, or Val, do you have anything else to add? I, I, I hope that answers the question to some extent. Yeah, definitely. It's um, we're compiling a lot of different data points, so things that you read in the literature, things that you've observed in the field, and things that you get back from um, a genetics perspective. So. Thank you so much. I think we'll go ahead and continue on. All right, so I'm going to go through um, a particular platform that uh, Monsanto has in um, uh, a group called the Climate Corporation. Um, and it's actually really quite interesting work. So. The people who are working um, in the Climate Corporation are data scientists, agronomists, um, engineers of all sorts, and they are really developing the tools that will be implemented in the, you know, cab of a planter, sprayer, um, combine that helps farmers make better decisions um, for that particular uh, area of land by using things like tablets and uh, and even some drone technology for, for imaging. Um, so in this particular example, um, when it comes to farming, there are kind of these four R's of nutrient stewardship. You want to make sure that you have um, fertility in the right uh, place, the right rate, at the right time. Um, and you want to uh, make sure that can you hear me okay? I'm getting some feedback. I uh, you sound fine, Valerie. Me. I was just checking to see if anybody else is still on, but uh, you seem to be fine. Okay. Um, and so farmers are really stewards of their land, and so they want to make sure that um, they're adjusting fertility um, accordingly, depending on the soil changes or um, um, the nutrients that are needed. So the main nutrients that you guys are teaching in your classroom are going to be like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Um, but there's also micronutrients or macronutrients rather. And farmers are really good at um, having a better understanding of what type of soil types they have. So you know, do they have sandy soil? Do they have clay soil, loamy, so on and so forth. And all of this will um, make a difference in what type of applications they're going to put on that particular field and what type of seeds they're going to put there, what type of hybrid of seeds. And so you can see on this platform, on this field view platform, um, that the farmer can go in there and they can actually name their fields. And if you know any farmers, you know that they have names for every single one of those fields. So in this particular case, this field is called the Green Valley Field. 
And what the farmer can do is highlight, you know, with their finger, they can um, they can uh, pick a particular zone, they can identify a particular zone, um, and they can it can give them information on target yields or the history of the bushels per acre in years past. And just as a reminder to everyone, um, an acre is about the size of a football field. I don't come from agriculture, so I actually didn't know that. And Bushel, we probably all think of like that bushel basket, but um, nowadays bushel is actually um, a quantity of weight. So for corn, I believe it's um, 56 pounds. Um, so they're looking at historical data from bushels per acre in years past. Um, they can record and better understand any applications that um, have been um, applied to those fields or need to be applied to those fields, like nitrogen, for example, you know, how much, at what rate, or things like a herbicide, like um, glyphosate, you know, how much, when, and they also know the, the soil types, the soil pH, and they can see random notes within this platform, too. So maybe they have a note about a certain irrigation system um, or, you know, a barn or something that's nearby. So they can better understand when they see the results come back uh, during planting or harvest, you know, what's going on there. Um, there's also this thing called variable rate seeding, um, and it is a, a technology that requires a hydraulic drive rate controller. And since the field is so varied, um, the farmer really wants to make sure that they're placing their seeds, um, you know, at the right population. So how many seeds can they get in one particular area of land? So if you look at the example on the, um, the screen, um, the areas in red, that means that that land really isn't um, as fertile as uh, the areas in green. So if you were a farmer, you would likely say, okay, I'm going to put my best hybrids in the green areas, and then I'm going to switch out the seed, uh, the seed cassette and put, um, you know, a different hybrid of seed in those red areas. Or I know that this particular part of the, uh, the field, you know, has um, sandy or clay um, soil types, and so I'm going to use this type of hybrid instead of that type of hybrid. And all of that information can be mapped and plotted within this um, climate field view system. Okay, so um, let me find my little pointer here. This device right here, my pointer is not working. Um, the thing that is on the left side of the screen and looks like a cylinder and says field view drive, um, this is a sensor. So this is this cylinder-like sensor that um, uh, is about, I don't know, fits probably in the size of the, the palm of your hand. And it plugs into compatible John Deere planters, sprayers, combines, and some uh, case planters and combines as well. And basically what it does is it's a sensor that's collecting information real time on the fly. And if you know a farmer, you know that prior to a technology like this, they were keeping their data and information in several different forms. So everything from flash drives to floppy disks to, you know, one computer hard drive and another computer hard drive or maybe just, you know, stacks and stacks of paper binders that had notes in them. So what this really allows them to do is have one, um, one platform um, that, that keeps all of their notes and their information in and this uh, sensor that hooks into their planter, sprayer, and combine allows them to better understand, you know, do I have a irrigation nozzle that is clogged, for example? I once had the opportunity to meet a farmer who immediately could address that problem on his farm because he saw that for whatever reason from the, the field map, you know, there was this weird line that was right in line with where the sprayer had gone, and it was because one of the sprayer nozzles was clogged. So he was immediately able to address that problem fix it, and then go about his day. And really for farmers, you know, that's what they need. They need to be able to solve problems on the fly. Now, what's really cool about this, I think, is um, classroom application. So FieldView um, is a app that is downloadable on your smartphone or smart tablet. 
And I've heard a couple of really clever ways um, teachers are using this in their classroom. So if you're teaching um, a class on soils or precision agriculture or ad mechanics or even coding, um, the, this is kind of a cool free uh, application that you can download to talk about uh, some of these concepts with as it relates to agriculture. Um, if you're, some people have the question of, oh, what about you know the uh, the other versions of this? So the FieldView Prime is free and it has you know good capabilities, but I would say not uh, the whole suite of capabilities. The FieldView Plus is um, more expensive and there's like a yearly subscription for that for the farmer. And what that allows them to do is have more of a better understanding of side by side comparisons of different fields, so they can see you know. Wow, this field that's over here near the river has certain attributes, and this field over here that's by the highway has different attributes. And they can see um, how those two are doing. Or farmers are, you know, natural tinkers. They love to experiment. So maybe they planted one type of hybrid on one field, and then they're going to compare it to uh, another hybrid that they had planted on another field to see which one is um, doing better or which one uh, after harvest, after their combine has gone through, you know, which one was higher yielding, um, and then use that information to make decisions later. And I believe there's one other version which is called Fieldview Pro, and that has some cool capabilities like uh, a nitrogen management advisor. So it allows the farmer to better understand, you know, when to apply nitrogen, where, and how much to be as you know, conservative as possible. Now, I think that this is really um, kind of a, a cool uh, thing that's up and coming. So, um, like I said, farmers can choose different hybrids um, to plant on their uh, their field. And, you know, it's not uncommon for a farmer to plant up to five, six different hybrids, for sure three hybrids. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, they could buy um, the cow corn seed, which is owned by Monsanto, and they could buy a hybrid that's from, you know, Pioneer, um, which is not Monsanto, and they can compare those two. And and farmers do that. Farmers like to um, have different options so that they can see what's working best for a certain field and, and compare those brands. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting, especially if you teach a um, uh, a coding class, uh, is this application to be able to identify um, disease. So what you're seeing here is if you can imagine, you know, a farmer sees some sort of uh, disease on their plant, they hold their camera or tablet up to it, their smartphone, excuse me, or their tablet up to it, and then it gives them back an answer that says, you know, hey, the risk for this disease is X and it is actually uh, southern rust or it is gray leaf spot. And it can tell them what type of um, um, fungus or what type of pressure is, is happening there. And then what those farmers can do is that they can compile um, this information that's now on this one platform and uh, share it with, uh, with people who help them, like agronomists, for example. So they can uh, have that conversation with the agronomist about, okay, how um, how do we now manage this, say, southern rust that's uh, on the corn plant? Oh, you know what? I just noticed that I'm missing a slide on drones. All right. So, sorry about that. You guys saw a picture of the, the drone um, over there on the the slide that talked about innovations in agriculture and, and uh, um, technologies that, that can be leveraged to help uh, with some of the challenges. Um, but drones in agriculture are really kind of interesting. So they're used in, in a couple of different ways. At Monsanto, um, we use drone technology um, for research. So we use it for imaging. Um, we use it to better understand uh, you know, how the, the, the plants are doing, um, how the plant health is, if there's insect pressure or if there's fungal pressure things like that, but some of the other applications of drones in agriculture um, I think are actually quite promising. And if you use resources like MIT, for example, 
um, they have some really cool um, stories of drones in agriculture. And one of them is aerial spraying. So the idea is that if you can use a drone and, you know, scout your crop, so scout, fly it over the field that, of interest, and you see that there's, you know, say some uh, fungal pressure that needs to be treated with a fungicide, you can use a specific amount of chemistry just to treat that um, particular area. And the, the liquid is applied right where needed. So you don't have to do a, a full topical spray. You can just spray where um, where the, the issue is. And I think that that's a really promising um, uh, solution in that, in, uh, for drone technology. Um, the other one is, you know, some of these fields, like I said, an acre is about the size of a, a football field. Um, these are large fields with low visibility and, you know, weather conditions vary. So drones are used for crop monitoring. Um, so instead of, you know, firing up your, your truck and driving over to X, Y, and Z field, you can stay in one spot and go and scout your crops to see, okay, did that windstorm um, damage the crop here and how much, or what did that hail do to the crop? Uh, and like I said, the other thing is health assessment. So drones are used to get a better understanding visually and with technologies like um, near-infrared light to better understand and track the changes of do we have disease pressure here or not, and if so, you know, how, how should we treat that? Um, like I said, MIT in particular has some pretty cool examples. One of them is on um, orchards and how drone technology was really uh, uh, beneficial in helping some orchards discover and apply just the right remedies um, precisely uh, so that, you know, the, the disease didn't get out of control and, and um, like, you know, decimate the whole orchard. So I think that it's really cool. Um, there was a question earlier about uh, the application of drones in middle school curriculum. I don't know specifically of um, curriculum that's been developed for the classroom, particularly at the middle school age, but I think that if you can get a um, reasonably priced drone and have these conversations with your students and partner with local farmers even or agronomists, um, to solve the problems that they have by getting your students involved and um, using drone technology, that would be really cool. And I think you would see the students really show a, a high investment in wanting to um, make sure that those, those you know, problems were solved because it's a real world application. They get to work with external people and feel like they can really contribute in, in an awesome way. Okay, so I'll pause for, for um, some questions. Thank you, Valerie. Um, a couple of questions uh, have been answered uh, as the chat has been uh, continuing on. Uh, Sandy brought up an interesting point. She was lamenting about how sometimes our berries in the wintertime uh, don't have much taste uh, and possibly because they've been uh, using traits, to, trying to gather traits to come out and losing that taste trait. Is anything being done to help with the taste of our food? Um, well, I, I guess it, it depends. So um, as far as sweetness goes um, in something like berries, yeah, definitely. There are food scientists and breeders who are specifically, um, you know, aimed at uh, creating berries that are, you know, juicier or and, and also confer disease resistance or things like that. Um, at Montana, we don't... Um, uh, from my understanding, we don't sell berry seeds, but, uh, you know, universities and, and other organizations are definitely doing research in those areas. Um, one area of research that we are doing um, at Montano are peppers. So there's a really cool pepper breeder um, who is in Florida, and he's trying to better understand, you know, how do you get peppers to be sweet, but also kind of have that um, crunchy texture to them, and better understanding the genetics there to um, uh, breed the best, the cross the best peppers. And again, um, like I said earlier in the program, there are only 10 transgenic crops. Um, peppers are not one of them. So it would be more of your row crops, like things like corn, soy, cotton, um, a couple of varieties of squash, arctic apple, 
uh, alfalfa, canola, um, sugar beets, and uh, the the potato. I think it's the innate potato. So, so no, uh, this is just for breeding, just conventional breeding. Thank you so much, Valerie. I think uh, in interest of time, we'll continue on now. Great. Jarrett and Jen, you want to tell them about some of the ideas for the classroom as engineers and how they can apply some cool concepts? Sure. So um, I don't know how many of you used Instructables or vis visited Instructables.com before, but it's a fun little website that has a ton of do-it-yourself projects. Um, being an engineer, I am a, I'm a tinkerer at heart. I have to sit at my desk and take my pen apart 900 times, and I do a lot of little fun projects at home uh, quite a bit. These are a couple of uh, fairly inexpensive um, little projects that I found that are ag-related and engineering-related projects that have pretty good instructions with them. From doing an automated uh, self-watering plant, um, I think the first one there um, is kind of a maybe a middle school level type uh, project. It's not super involved. Uh, the, the second one there in the list is a, a little bit more complicated. doesn't uh, include uh, some soldering, uh, doing some more uh, basic coating, some things with some Raspberry Pis and some Arduino-type systems, um, but it actually uses an automatic, like, water or moisture sensor that you would put in the soil and then take back to a, an automated water valve. Uh, the next one is simple and expensive water filters. There's three uh, links there that I've uh, put together. Um, with making water filters out of tuna cans and water bottles and different filtration systems. I believe the top one there is elementary school um, kind of age. The middle one is more of a middle school. And then the, the bottom one there be, being a little bit higher level, probably high school or maybe maybe eighth grade level. So I hope that helps. I, I think Jen may have something to add, maybe not. So. No, Jared, I think you know, in terms of ideas for the classroom, I think the big takeaway for me would be from a math and science standpoint, it's just exposure, exposure, exposure. So the more you can expose your students to it, make it fun. And, you know, at the end of the day, one of the things I know in our group that's really important is don't have a fear of failure because really what we find is some of the best scientists that we have fail most often. And however, they've figured out a way to, when they're working on stuff, um, they've figured out a way to fail fast. So think about that when you're designing stuff. And, you know, I, I, w I would say teach kids that it's okay to fail. Just figure out a way to, to work through, because that helps them work through problems. Thanks again for your time. Great. So I am uh, adding a link in the chat about Raspberry Pi really quick, if my computer will operate correctly, because uh, there was a question about that. Um, it's just a really inexpensive um, microprocessor. I believe it's run on Linux, and we use them in the lab quite frequently, actually. So you can, you can program them to uh, do some sensing work. You can program them to do some imaging work. Um, it's really kind of cool, especially for uh, uh, classroom applications. Um, here, let me see if this is working now. There we go. Um, and in fact, uh, Monsanto is right across the street from the Danforth Plant Science Center. And if anyone is near the St. Louis area at the end of January, they are holding a Raspberry Pi jam, um, which I think is just a great you know, way to, to uh, title it, but um, they are having, you know, companies, large, small, private, public, uh, nonprofits all come together and show students and teachers how to use ra Raspberry Pis in creative ways um, in their classroom. Again, that's called the Raspberry Pi Jam at the end of this month um, in St. Louis, Missouri at the Danforth Plant Science Center.
So if there are any questions in the chat room that we didn't get to, Carolyn, we can answer them now. Um, uh, or, you know, people can always, always reach out to us at standardeducation.outreach.monsanto.com with any questions they have. And feel free to add uh, Jared and I on Twitter. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, there aren't any questions right now, but uh, as we're wrapping up the program uh, today, please feel free, uh, participants, to put any additional questions in the chat. And uh, in just a couple minutes after the time for doing the um, survey, we'll be glad to uh, stick around and answer a couple more questions. I'd like to thank today's presenters, Valerie Bayers, Jarrett. Seplinski and Jennifer Becker. Thank you so much. And those of you who uh, are old hands at this, if you know where that virtual clapping button is, please feel free to give our wonderful presenters a virtual clap today. I'd also like to thank the sponsor of today's web seminar, Monsanto. And thank you so much to the National Science Teachers Association for their support in web seminars.